Well, brothers and sisters, as we come to this passage in Thessalonians, let me just pray for us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can look at your word together today, even though we're far apart from one another, that we can still do this. And we pray now as we look at this passage from 1 Thessalonians that you'd strengthen our faith in our Lord Jesus, that we might stand firm and that we might grow and flourish in him. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I wonder if you can imagine yourself isolated and alone, separated from your friends, unsure how they're going, how they're faring in the midst of some deep persecution or deep trouble. Imagine you know that things aren't easy for them, that they're struggling with isolation, afflictions of various kinds. In fact, their world has been turned upside down recently. It's not hard to imagine, is it? It sounds a lot like lockdown. Well, it is, uh, but it's also the uh, situation of Paul and the Thessalonians, isolated, separated from one another. This is indeed the context we come into as we read this passage that we've just read today. It's a church birthed into a culture of persecution, uh, a church that Paul, Timothy and Silas were separated from uh, and which they actually planted. But because of their quick uh, departure from the town, uh, they were unable to disciple the town, the people at that church, uh, and as such, they were deeply concerned for them as to what was happening once they'd gone. Last week, we saw, uh, a lot of this, didn't we? We saw Paul's deep concern, uh, his affectionate concern for the church of the Thessalonians. And so concerned was he, he'd sent his co-worker Timothy back to find out what had happened to them, And this week, I'm pleased to report, we find out some really good news. We hear good and assuring news that must have been a great relief to Paul. The church had not only survived, but it had thrived. And uh, they, in fact, share the, the affection that Paul shared for them. It must have been a balm for Paul's soul as he heard the good news from Timothy's tongue. Well, today we look at this good news and we look at how Paul, Timothy and Silas, how did they respond to hearing such good news? Well, three things. Firstly, it brings Paul particularly, but it brings them to life, verses 6 to 8. We see they respond with thanksgiving and prayer in verses 9 and 10. And we see a special prayer that they make for the Thessalonian church at the end of the passage there in verses 11 to 13. Well, let's get into it, having a look at uh, those first few verses and how it brings uh, Paul, Timothy and Silas to life. Let me read again to you the good news which Timothy reports in his initial and, and its initial effect on Paul from verses 6 to 8. If you've got a Bible, this would be a good time to pick it up and just have a read again. Uh, verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. Paul's fears, we read in this passage, were abated, weren't they? Despite the church's afflictions, Timothy tells Paul this good news. The Thessalonians were standing firm. They were standing fast in the Lord. They hadn't been moved by the afflictions. They hadn't been tempted by the evil one. And as a cherry on top of this good news, we hear in verse 6, they reciprocate Paul's affections for him. It's overwhelmingly good news. And what effect does this have on Paul? Well, in verses 7 and 8, we can see the result. Have a look at it. It's on your screen. Here's what Paul says in verse 7. In all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. Comforted. Uh, In their turmoil and distress over the fate of the Thessalonian church, in their own suffering. Uh, the good news of the Thessalonians' faith has brought them comfort. Comfort in their affliction. Comfort in their distress. 
They are so enraptured to hear this good news that the Thessalonians were standing fast or standing firm in the Lord that it brings them life. We read on in, our, in the next verse, in verse 8. Have a look. Paul says, For now we live if, we, if you are standing fast in the Lord. For now we live. Paul, Timothy and Silas are so united in the Lord to the Thessalonians that the prospect of them moving from their faith leaves them in great distress. But the prospect and the good news that they hear that they're standing fast, standing firm in the Lord their God, it brings them such comfort. It brings them to life. To life. That's how good it is to see brothers and sisters standing fast and walking with the Lord. It brings us to life. Uh, I grew up in Geelong, uh, going to an Anglican church called St. Albans in Hamlin Heights. Uh, and in the summer of 2019, just before I started here at back, uh, I got to go back there and preach. Uh, there was something life-giving about that service. It, it wasn't the being in the familiar space, so that was nice, uh, and it was, it was nice to be back. It wasn't even the words of the service or the songs that we sang. It wasn't even the opportunity to preach. Rather, it was seeing people who'd been Christians for all of my childhood, who taught me Sunday school, uh, who told me about Jesus, who'd been there to pick me up when I'd fallen. It was seeing people that I knew still standing firm in the Lord Jesus, people still being Christians, living for Jesus with their lives, uh, you know, seven or eight years after I'd last seen them, some of them. They continued to stand firm in the Lord. It's encouraging and it's life-giving to see people standing firm for the Lord. So brothers and sisters, let me encourage you to keep standing firm in the Lord. Keep standing fast. Don't let anything move you. Let your mantra for life be that you will stand firm in the Lord Jesus. And don't underestimate how big a thing that is for others to see you standing firm. How big it could be when we return from lockdown for others to see you here in the church building standing firm in the Lord Jesus. It's a great encouragement for others. It's a great comfort for people when they're suffering and in affliction to actually see you there with them standing firm in the Lord. So can I encourage you to keep standing firm? And to encourage others by meeting together, showing them that you're standing firm in the Lord Jesus. Well, this good news that they're standing fast, they're standing firm in the Lord, is such good news to Paul, Timothy and Silas. It's brought them life. And this good news then turns Paul straight into thanksgiving and prayer. We read on uh, from verses 9 to 10. Let me read again. Verse 9. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day, that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. As you read this and hear this, we see that Paul is full, isn't he, of joyful thanks. In his joy, Paul recognises God's work in the Thessalonians' life, the miracle, in fact, of life amongst them. It is God's doing that they're standing fast in the Lord. And Paul asks the question, what thanksgiving can we return to God for this good news, for this standing firm of the Thessalonians? Paul recognises he can't give back enough Thanks, that is. He can't give back enough thanks for the wonderful gift uh, of the Thessalonians' faith. It's brought him such joy, such joy. And it's always this way, isn't it? God gives us things that we can't give back. Uh, we can't pay him back for them. He, Paul can't pay God back for the joy that he's brought him. He can't give enough thanks. Our lives, I think, should recognise this, that God is a giving God uh, and we should be full of thanks, but realizing we can never give back enough. 
but our lives should indeed emit a thankfulness that Paul has here as Christians, all the while recognising it's a gift from God. While Paul's joyful, he's full of thanks, but you see, even though the danger has passed, the Thessalonians are standing firm, we see Paul keeps on praying, doesn't he? He continues to pray in verse 10 for a reunion with the Thessalonian church. He still wants to see them, but his purpose in coming has changed. Uh, It's no longer to check that they have faith, uh, but instead we see, I've jumped ahead, in uh, verse 10 here, we see that it's to supply what is lacking in your faith. Uh, Paul is coming no longer to check on their faith that they have it. He knows they have it. He wants to supply now what's lacking in it. But what is it that he feels is lacking? What is it Paul feels is lacking in the Thessalonians' faith? When we, re- when we read that, supply what's lacking, we could think of it like this car that you can see on your screen. It's missing parts, isn't it? It's missing parts here, there and everywhere, in fact. There's great deficiencies that need to be rectified. To supply what is lacking here is to fill in completely missing parts of their faith. Something like the church, you know, didn't get that they were even called to love one another. That could be something that's really lacking. But I don't think this is the picture that Paul has in mind. This is not what he's saying. Rather, we could read, supply what is lacking like this picture, like this small plant. It's flourishing, isn't it? But it's young. It's not fully matured. And to supply what is lacking here is to encourage it to just keep growing, to keep doing what it's doing, to keep pleasing God more and more. It's not that there is some huge deficiency It's just that the plant needs to reach maturity to be fully grown. And this is, I think, what Paul has in mind when he says he wants to supply what is lacking in your faith to the Thessalonian church. This prayer that we've read here in uh, chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians shows us more of what Paul thinks is important, which is people standing firm and flourishing in Christ. So Paul prays about this. But notice Paul's prayer is not uh, just a substitute for Christian service. It's part of it. He doesn't just pray God provide what they need. He prays God use me to provide what they need. Paul is eager to serve, isn't he? He wants to be the one that God uses to supply the lack. I used to lead a uh, scripture union kids holiday program in Mallacoota. Uh, And every day we had to plan uh, a new program, you know, a a new upfront uh, drama. There were always roles to fill, things to do. Uh, So each day we'd have a volunteering session uh, and we'd ask people to fill the roles. I'd say, who's happy to to set up chairs? Oh, thanks, Steve. Uh, Who's happy to... Uh, do a silly skit to advertise Tuesday's event. Oh, thanks, Steph. Uh, Who's happy to do a skit on prayer? Dead silence. I'd think, come on, guys. You know, someone's got to do this skit. I'd look around and think, why doesn't Ben fill this role? Well, what about Jess? And as I was asking for help, It dawned on me. Everyone else had already volunteered. What about me? Why couldn't I fill this role? Well, this mindset ought to be the mindset of all of us. Don Carson, who writes a book on this prayer in the book of Thessalonians says this, relatively few of us are called to cross-cultural ministry. Few of us will be able to minister personally to all the believers for whom we ought to be praying. But the mindset of service should belong to all of us, especially when we pray. 
He goes on, certainly all of us can be doing something. As we pray for believers we know, we may be able to write an encouraging letter. Befriend a teenager who's beginning to go adrift. Take a fatherless child fishing. Start an inductive Bible study for young Christians in the subdivision. Quietly administer a humble word of admonition to someone who is doing damage with unguarded speech. Send some free books to a pastor in the so-called third world. These things ought not to be done without prayer. Conversely, praying with Paul will impel us to do some of these things and more. Both in our praying and in our immediate personal service, we will strive to make up what is lacking in someone else's faith. Don Carson saying, you have a job to do, I have a job to do. We should be praying for people that God would supply that lack, but we should be praying, God, may you use me to supply that lack and seeing how we can do that. Well, this is Paul's prayer for himself and for Timothy and Silas that they would be supplying the lack. And Paul turns from this prayer for themselves to a prayer, a special prayer for the Thessalonian church we see in verses 11 to 13. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. It's a great prayer. It's a special prayer for the Thessalonian church. It's a prayer for the Lord to make them grow in love for others to a point of overabundance. Like imagine a reservoir so full it starts to flood over and over and fill other areas. There's so much love. That's what Paul was praying for, that it overflows. Again, it's not that they're not already a loving church, because they are. We actually have encouragements of their love earlier in chapter one of this letter. But it's for its increase that they'd be doing this more and more. And Paul, Timothy and Silas are a great visible example of this to the church of Thessalonica and to us as well, aren't they? They show us this type of love, a love that's really concerned with the faith of others, concerned that others are standing firm, that they're growing in their faith in Jesus. That should be our concern too. But why does Paul want them to grow in love? Well, he tells us the goal in this prayer in verse 13. You can read it on your screen. It's so that the Lord may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. The goal, according to this verse, is blameless hearts. Blameless hearts before God when Jesus returns. Uh, Paul qualifies of what this blamelessness is, saying that he wants them to be blameless in holiness. Blameless in holiness. Uh, holiness is a state. It, it's, it's a term used of God. He's holy. It's a term also used of things specially set apart, dedicated to God. Uh, so in praying that the Thessalonians might be blameless in holiness, he's praying that their hearts might be fully devoted to God, entirely his. So Paul's prayer is for the Lord to make the Thessalonians' hearts entirely oriented and devoted towards God. And it seems that love for others brings them towards this goal. Well, over the coming weeks, we're going to look a bit more at brotherly love. So I'm not going to go there today, uh, but I'll leave that for next week. Uh, and uh, we'll also touch again on holiness as it comes up. And, of course, the second coming of our Lord Jesus. Uh, these are three topics mentioned in this prayer, and they're three significant topics that make up the vast majority of the second half of this letter, which we enter into next week. But here... Paul gives us a great model of prayer. And what a great lesson it is for us in lockdown. 
Because prayer is a very COVID safe activity, isn't it? And we can all pray during lockdown. So my encouragement for you is to be praying for each other. Pray for each other this prayer from the letter of Thessalonians. Put it in your own words or pray it as written. Go through our church address uh, page by page, maybe a page a day or a page a week, and pray this for those people on that page. Pray for the whole church this prayer regularly. It's a great prayer to pray. Well, Paul's given us a masterclass here in what really matters. Because what really matters for Paul is what should really matter for us. For him, the thing that's most important is the faith of his brothers and sisters in Christ. That they're standing firm, they're standing fast in the Lord. And not just that, but they're growing, they're flourishing in him. This is Paul's great concern, it should be ours as well. Paul also shows us that that concern shouldn't just stop with wanting that for others, but we should be praying that we be involved in that and praying for our brothers and sisters that they're they're growing, they're flourishing. So let's pray for one another. We can be a part of that great work of prayer, can't we? Well, uh, we can pray to this end, so I thought, let's do that now. Let me conclude by praying for our church, praying for us this week, uh, that we be growing and uh, standing firm in our Lord. Let's pray. God, our Father and our Lord Jesus, we thank you that you give us one another in Christ. We thank you for the joy that we have as our brothers and sisters stand firm in you. We pray that you would help us to see and know this joy and be ever thankful. As Paul prayed, we pray that you might reunite us together again soon and help us each to supply what is lacking in one another's faith encouraging and supporting each other this day and every day until you return and would you make us increase and abound in love for one another and for everyone following the example of our lord of paul of timothy and silas of all faithful loving christians so that our hearts might be established and strengthened to be blameless in holiness, set apart and completely devoted to you, our God, when our Lord Jesus returns with all his saints. We ask this in his name and pray, come Lord Jesus. Amen.